my scars Peace by peace restore my heart Take what's broken, make it whole again Your power, your presence Break strongholds, King of heaven When you speak, mountains move I believe there will be breakthrough Your power, your presence Break strongholds, the King of heaven Almighty God, you are the overcomer, defender of my heart. By your power, the oceans open wide, the fire falls down, heaven and earth alike. King Jesus, forever by my side. Mountains break the walls of hell in the heavens. Almighty God, you are overcomer, defender of my heart. By your power, the oceans open wide. The fire falls down, heaven and earth collide. Sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my Lord Thou hast sought me to say It is well It is well 
Lord, today we, we come to you and we ask in the midst of a literal storm outside that we know that you can calm the storm that's emotional or physical or social or spiritual, whatever is going on in our life, Lord, you can calm that too. And through it all, we can say that it is well. Lord, we know that you are good and that through you all things are good. So, Lord, we pray that in the situations that we're in, we can look to you and say, God, as much as life is chaotic and as much as stuff is going down <laughs> around us, we can look to you and say, God, you are good and it is well. It's in your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Will you take your seat?
Good morning. Uh, my name is Mike Cordetti. I'm one of the teaching elders here at Cornerstone, and I'm uh, excited to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, we're going to be uh, actually beginning a new series, uh, a new sermon series this morning, focusing on some of the common objections to Christianity. Uh, you know, there's a point at which we all come to where every, every Christian must arrive, where the fact that we were raised a Christian, or we have a Bible in the house, or, you know, we went to church when we were a kid, uh, doesn't, just doesn't cut it anymore. Right? We have to start to engage in the process of making our faith our own at some point and figuring out if this is a real thing for me or not. At some point, we have to, we have to ask, this means we have to ask the hard questions um, about our faith and the world. Um, it's my conviction that the unexamined faith is a fairly mediocre and uh, uninteresting faith. 1 Peter 3.15 uh, says that we should always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have by anyone that asks us. And we can't do that if we've never actually asked ourselves those questions. If I've never actually st- sat with myself and said, why do I believe this? And does this actually make sense? And what about this thing, right? Um, these philosophical questions that people have been wrestling with since the dawn of time, right? If God is good, then what about this? Or, or why does this? You all with me? And so this week we're going to look at uh, kind of the question of suffering in the world. If God is good, then why is there evil? Why is there suffering? Bob called me up a couple weeks ago and said, I want you to talk about why suffering exists. And I said, oh, is that all? Okay. (laughs) Good. Now, first off, I just want to assure you that it's not a sin to ask questions. Okay? It's It's not a sin. It's not a problem to question, to doubt, to ponder, to dare I say doubt. I think in a lot of the religious traditions in which some of us were raised, questions were not always encouraged, maybe not even always allowed. I think maybe you had an experience as a child or maybe as an adult where you approached a religious leader and you asked a question and you were just kind of soundly shut down. You had the door just closed in your faith. They said, well, just have faith or because the Bible says so. And that was kind of, you know, all you got. Those answers usually mean I don't really know either, but let's not talk about it. <laughs> I think, unfortunately, for a lot of us, our experience uh, is that we don't feel feel welcome or comfortable bringing that struggle into church. And the reality is that church should be the place, should be the safest place to ask questions or to have struggles, right? Religious traditions that forbid questions are far more fragile than the God that we serve. And the tradition of Jesus was not afraid of questions. In the Gospels, Jesus has asked like 180 questions plus, by different people, his disciples, religious leaders, community leaders. As far as I can tell, he answers maybe eight of them. Um, His most common response is usually to ask his own question or, or to tell a story or something. But what he never does is he never looks down on people who are genuinely searching, genuinely questioning. The older that I get and the farther I travel in my Uh, my journey with Jesus, the less I think faith is about reaching a place of certainty. I think it's more about learning to ask and uh, and learning to sit in the complexity of really good questions. We should never be afraid to ask why. And so I want to acknowledge that with all respect to Bob, this is not a topic that I'm going to adequately answer this morning (laughs) in one sermon. Uh, There really are no easy answers when it comes to questions about evil. And suffering. I think for a lot of us in this room, we have been dealt absolutely devastating circumstances at various points in our lives. We've dealt with trial and tragedy and sickness and loss and abuse and betrayal. And we want it to make sense. We want to know there's a reason for things. We want to understand why. We want to know why God, if God is indeed good, why do these things still happen? And why are they allowed? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do babies get brain cancer? Why is personal evil so pervasive and destructive? Why is natural evil like hurricanes and floods and tornadoes so destructive? Why doesn't God protect us? Why doesn't God answer? Do you have any intention of engaging our culture and our neighbors with the claims of Christ? We have to be prepared 
to engage in substantive conversations with these kinds of questions because thoughtful skeptics and honest Christians alike are wrestling with them, are dealing with them. And it has nothing to do with a lack of faith. It has everything to do with honesty and genuineness and transparency. And so let me just kind of start with a caveat this morning. If you're looking for simple answers, right, one-liners that you can kind of stick in your pocket and just throw out at somebody when they ask you a hard question, I'm probably going to disappoint you this morning. Um, I don't have them. The Bible doesn't offer them. While I once craved those kind of answers at this time in my life, I'm not really interested in them because they always fall flat. To be honest, I'd much rather address this subject over a cup of coffee or maybe a burger and fries <laughs> with somebody than in a sermon format. So I'm going to give it a shot this morning with the proviso that if this opens up a door for you that doesn't shut by the end of the 18 to 20 minutes I've got this morning, that's okay. Don't ignore that, right? Don't avoid questions out of fear or embarrassment. Don't blow that off. Find one of the faith leaders here at Cornerstone or anywhere else or someone in your family that you trust and have continue this conversation. Because at best, we're going to scratch the surface here this morning. All right, so let's get into it. Why does suffering occur? Believe it or not, this is one of the dominant questions in which the biblical authors wrestle. There are entire books in the Bible devoted to this longing, this, this question, right? Psalm 13 is one such text. It's composed at a time in King David's life. It's a particularly low point in his life. It's right after his son Absalom basically betrays him and conspires against him. In Psalm 13, David writes, O Lord, how long will you forget? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Let's just be honest. We have all prayed this prayer and felt this tension. And I'm not sure that David ever reached a more satisfying answer than we have at this point. John's Gospel, uh, the writer recalls a particular situation where Jesus faces this very same question, right? Jesus is in Jerusalem for the festival of, of Sukkot, the festival of tabernacles, and he's engaged in a lot of discussion at this point about who he is, um, where he came from, what he's about, uh, about himself, what other people have asked about him, his disciples, community leaders. And in chapter 9 of John's gospel, he comes across a man who's been blind for his entire life. John recalls this. He says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who'd been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why is this man blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Now, this was a really common question for discussion at the time of Jesus, and it reflected a fairly dominant a conventional worldview at this time. This was a fairly normal cultural religious debate, namely that physical circumstances reflected spiritual condition or divine favor or lack of divine favor, right? The conversation surrounding something like this was basically Obviously, something did, someone did something wrong for this to be this way, right? And the debate was about who it was. Was it him? Was it somebody else? Was it back in his family? If you were afflicted in some way, it's got to be the result of something somebody did. There's got to be a 2 plus 2 equals 4 kind of explanation here, right? And so the disciples, they regard this man as kind of an unsolved puzzle. They want to get their rabbi's take on this great cultural debate. Which one is it? Is it him? Was it somebody else? Where do we lay the blame? I think on the surface we can kind of read this and go, why would they ask such a dumb question? I think there is a sense that we naturally seek the same kind of explanation when something bad happens, right? When the terrible exists, we want to know why. Why is this happening to me? Why is this going on? in the world. Someone you know is getting divorced, what's the first thing that goes in your mind? Well, whose fault is it? Who did what? Someone you love receives a terrible diagnosis. Why them? 
of all the people in the world, why them? Right? There's a car accident you get into. Why me? The question of how an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God can allow evil to exist is a question that sticks with people regardless of their religious beliefs. Philosophers, seekers, everybody, they've all offered kind of possible explanations. Maybe there is no God. Maybe that's the answer, right? Or maybe God didn't know that was going to happen. Or maybe God did know it was going to happen, but God couldn't do anything to stop it from happening. Or maybe God did know and could have stopped it, but just doesn't particularly care. In 1940, the Christian thinker and scholar C.S. Lewis published an amazing book called The Problem of Pain. And he sums up the argument thusly. He says, this is the argument. If God were good, he would wish to make his creatures perfectly happy. And if God were almighty, he would be able to do what he wished. But the creatures, us, are not happy. Therefore, God lacks either goodness or power or both. Have you ever heard these arguments? Have you ever heard them from your own heart? Throughout this wonderful book, Lewis uh, addresses this argument uh, that the following three propositions cannot be true. He says, God, either God is all-powerful, God is wholly good, evil exists. They can't all be right. One of them has got to be wrong. Right? One of them's got to be false. Now, as Christians, we believe that God is all-powerful. We believe that God is wholly good. However, we also know that evil does exist. Tragedy does exist. Suffering and calamity and misfortune exist. And so we are left with the question, how can that Suffering is different from every angle. When someone we love is suffering, we need someone to blame. We want someone to blame, right? We have a need to make sense of it, and oftentimes we can't make sense of it. Are you with me? And so in our attempt to define what's happening, what God is doing, we sometimes say things, well-meaning things, like, well, God has a plan, right? The Lord works in mysterious. Well, it was just his time to go. She's in a better place. Just have faith. Please resist the urge to say any of those things when someone is hurting. There's truth in every one of those statements, but if you've ever been on the receiving end of one of those well-meaning but poorly worded phrases, you know how empty they can feel. My mother passed away from cancer about 10 years ago. And, uh, and when she died, I heard people say, well, she's in a better place. And I said, I don't care. I want her here with me. I wore out the floorboards praying for healing for my mom. So it wasn't a question of my faith. It wasn't me not praying hard enough. So I have to, I'm left with what do I do with that? There's a guy named Charles Templeton who was actually kind of BFFs with Billy Graham for a while. He was a Canadian preacher and evangelist, and for a long time, he was Billy Graham's right-hand man. And in his early 40s, he renounced his faith and embraced agnosticism after wrestling with doubt. He tells a story that he was in a doctor's office, and he picked up a Life magazine, and uh, the life, cover of the Life magazine was covering a famine in Africa. And there was a photograph of it of a woman who was just bare bones holding a dead baby, looking at the sky as if pleading. And Templeton says, he tells a story about looking at this picture and just saying, what do I do with this? If all it would have taken was a little bit of rain. How could it possibly be a loving God when all they needed was rain? I've wrestled with that. I suspect some of you have wrestled with that question in your life. Why does suffering exist in the good world that a good God created? Again, this is just the start to a conversation, but I'd like to share some thoughts and some conclusions that I've reached about the presence of suffering and evil 
in the present world. And it's certainly not an exhaustive list, um, but I'd also like to share some thoughts on how we can experience hope in the midst of that very real circumstance. The fact is the Bible kind of takes the presence of suffering in the world as a given. The Bible writers don't really seem concerned about why suffering exists as much as they are concerned with the distribution of suffering, uh, the problem of justice in the world and inequity in the world. And a lot of it has to do with our response to those things and our contribution to those things. So I think there's three main reasons suffering exists. The first one we can call sinful, right? There is a human component to a lot of the suffering in the world. One reason that there's suffering in the world is this category we'll call sinful. People say, well, if God is a God of love, why didn't God create a perfect world? Right? Why didn't God create humanity knowing that humanity would screw everything up, would rebel at it? We look in the Bible, we read the poetic narratives in the book of Genesis. They tell us about the, the beginning, the creation, the foundations for everything, and the, the creation of God's good world. And, and the story tries to shed light on how we got from there to here. Okay, chapter 1, we have this wonderful poem about the foundation of the world, how God created the world step by step by step. And every step along the way, God stops and goes, that's good. And then he goes to the next step and goes, that's good. And everything along the way, he says, good. He creates the land and says it's good. And he separates the light from the dark. And he says that's good. And he creates the water and the stars and the shrubs and the mockingbirds and the duck-billed platypi. And, and every step along the way, he says, this is good. God creates humans. And in Genesis 131, God looked over all that God had made, and God saw that it was very good. So we read a little further in chapters 2 and 3, and we discover the first humans, the first man, the first woman. They are blessed to live in this perfect environment. They had purpose. They had provision. They enjoyed God's presence with them in this place. We find that inherent in life, is choice, right? God didn't want an ant farm that he could just kind of keep on his dresser and look at every once in a while. Uh, God creates humanity for relationship. God creates humanity to experience the goodness of God. And so a very necessary factor in relationship is choice, right? Either we have wind-up little toys that we just wind up and they just wobble around and fall over, or you have beings with agency. To love you have to be able not to love. I remember a time when I was probably in elementary school and I came home and I'd been bullied or kids had made fun of me for something. And I'm crying, I don't have any friends, nobody likes me. And my mom said, well, I like you. And I said, you don't count, you have to like me, right? Rich Mullins one time uh, told a story about someone tell, saying that God loves everyone. And Rich said, uh, reportedly said, well, that, all that means is that God doesn't have any choice. If he loves everybody. There's this kind of idea where, where God, where we have to choose to love, right? The original existence of these humans is to live within God's ordered world. And central in that story is this special tree, right? Remember the tree? This invitation to trust God. God says, I will tell you what is good and what is not good. Trust me. And we will live in this paradise together. And so these first humans had the same choice that we all have. Can we trust God or will we take the authority to define what is right and wrong in our own life? Will we take that control away from God? And you know the story. We know the choice they made because it's the choice that we make. When humans do that, we wrest control of our lives away from God and it always leads to broken relationships and tragedy, and violence, and death. And we have seen this over and over and over again in our lives. And so some of the suffering in the world is a result of the abuse of that choice. Just like God gave Adam and Eve the choice to walk with God and enjoy the abundant life God provided, God gives us that choice today. And sometimes we choose beauty, and sometimes we choose service, and sometimes we choose care and compassion, and sometimes we choose selfishness and power and deceit, and inconsideration. We have to own that. A lot of the suffering in the world is due to us. C.S. Lewis, in The Problem of Pain, he makes the point that our rebellion doesn't 
break God, right? He writes that a man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the world's darkness on the walls of his cell. What we do doesn't break God, but our rebellion does break us. He goes on to write, he says, when souls become wicked, they will certainly use this possibility to hurt one another. And this perhaps accounts for four-fifths of the suffering of men. It is men, not God, who have produced racks and whips and prison and slavery and guns and bayonets and bombs. Right? We make the choices every day to build up or to tear down. Every choice we have echoes in one direction or another. The choice to disobey or to obey. The choice to shoplift and fudge our taxes and hit our kids uh, nor our spouse, the choice to deny God's authority with our words and our actions rather than exemplifying the goodness of Eden. And so let's, let's face it, like wind-up toys would have been less destructive. But God creates humans and gives them the responsibility of living in beauty or in rebellion. And this opportunity to enjoy God's care and be part of the ongoing creation. And God does not compel that choice. Because if God did, there would be no choice. You with me? Now, there is suffering that exists that is directly caused by our actions. There's suffering that exists that's not caused by our actions, at least not directly, right? As we mentioned, our rebellion breaks us, but it also breaks our world. The real presence of sin and discord in our world has a real and tangible effect on our world. Almost daily we see pictures of devastating hurricanes and tornadoes and tsunamis and wildfires that just bring destruction to the earth and they cause untold tragic death, right? There was a powerful earthquake that struck western Japan on New Year's Day a couple weeks ago, killing dozens of people, destroying homes and triggering fears of greater harm from aftershocks and tsunamis and, and landslides. And so we ask, well, why doesn't God do something about that? Certainly God could, right? Colossians 1.17 tells us that Jesus Christ holds all creation together. When we read the Gospels, we see that Jesus' disciples are in awe of him because even the storms obey him, the wind and the waves. So what's that about? I doubt any of us will forget the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami that swallowed Asia. Or Hurricane Katrina back in 2005 that devastated New Orleans and the surrounding areas. And even then, people grasped for reasons and blame. Prominent religious leaders all over the world tried to explain why these things happened. Well, this must have happened because the people were rebellious. And Katrina happened because there, were, there was voodoo going on in the French Quarter and because there was terrorism and racism and gay people living there. And we had to figure out there's got to be a reason for these things, right? We need someone to blame when this stuff happens. And just as humanity suffers because of sin and is longing for the day of God's complete deliverance, I think creation is also suffering. And creation also longs for the day when all will be made whole. Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, he says, All creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, against the will of creation, creation was subjected to the curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. You look at hurricanes and earthquakes and tsunamis. These were not in Eden. They were not part of Eden. And so the creation, meaning everything that God has made, it's suffering. It's subject to something Paul describes using the Greek word matinatis. It's a word that implies something that's warped or perverse or sickly or weak. Or false, God did not create the world the way that it is currently. Creation didn't choose 
to be this way, right? The trees and the streams and the animals and the sky and the climatological conditions didn't choose an existence of frustration. But the curse, the consequence of this broken world is that nothing works the way that it's supposed to. Genesis chapter 3, God proclaims the consequences of the new world that's been inaugurated by the presence of sin. And rebellion. He says relationships will be discordant. Creation itself, things like childbirth and farming, stewardship of life and land, everything's going to be hard. Everything's going to be painful. And these were curses, not in the sense that God is punishing people, but they were the results or the effects of a world that is not fully under God's control. There's a, a Welsh Congregationalist minister and medical doctor named David Martin Lloyd Jones. He once offered this wonderful insight. He said, I wonder whether the phenomenon of the spring supplies us with a part answer. Nature every year makes an effort to renew itself, to produce something permanent, to come out of the death and the darkness of all that's so true of the winter. In the spring, it seems to be trying to produce a perfect creation, to be going through some kind of birth pangs year by year, but unfortunately, doesn't quite succeed. Where spring leads only to summer, summer leads to autumn, autumn back to winter. And poor old nature tries every year to defeat the vanity of the principle of death and decay and disintegration that is in it. But it cannot do so. It fails every time. And so it goes on groaning and travailing in pain together until now. I like that idea. We know there's a day coming when all that's bent will be made straight. All that suffers will be given relief. And this applies to the natural world as much as it does to us. I think there's a third category for human suffering. And it involves the satanic. When we talk about the satanic, we're not talking about some banal excuse like the devil made me do it. Okay, We're not talking about red pitchforks. We're not talking about makeshift statues of goat's masks and pool noodles in the Iowa Capitol last month. We're acknowledging that there is an enemy in this world that stands opposed to all that, all that is of God and all that is good. We are acknowledging there is an enemy that met Adam and Eve in the garden and whispered in their ears. There is an enemy that met Jesus in the wilderness and tried to do the same thing again, unsuccessfully. This being does not have any name that we know. The scriptures just referred to as the Satan or the Satan. Just a word that means adversary or opponent. In the famous parable of the farmer and the seed, it's the Satan that snatches away the kingdom seed before it can take root and it hears life. In Jesus' parable of the weeds, Jesus speaks of an enemy who sows weeds among the wheat. And he identifies that enemy as the evil one or the devil. So just as Jesus came to bring us life in the abundance, this enemy, the Satan, comes to, comes to steal and kill and destroy. And while most terrible things in the world can be attributed to human selfishness and greed, there is some capital E evil. Right? There is a hidden world of principalities and angel angelic battle of which we are only rarely aware. Quoting a lot of C.S. Lewis this morning. I apologize for that, but uh, I've been doing a lot of reading of him recently. And there's another great book he wrote uh, called The Screwtape Letters. It's a fictional work, uh, but he answers the question in this of whether he really believes in a devil. You know, people talk about the satanic. People say, you don't really believe in that, do you? And Lewis writes, now, if by devil you mean a power opposite to God, and like God, self-existent from all eternity, the answer is no. There's no uncreated being except God. God has no opposite. No being could attain a perfect badness opposite to the perfect goodness of God because when you've taken away every kind of good thing, intelligence, will, memory, energy, existence itself, there'd be nothing left. The proper question is whether I believe in devil. C.S. Lewis says I do. That is to say I believe in angels. And I believe that some of these, by the abuse of their free will, 
have become enemies to God and as a corollary to us. These we may call devils. They don't differ in nature from good angels, but their nature is deprived. And so devil is the opposite of angel, only as bad man is the opposite of good man. Satan, the leader or dictator of the angels, is not the opposite of God. He's the opposite of Michael. All right? So there is this being that exists, but it's not like God's opposite back there. Okay, and again, the subject of angels, demons is a rabbit hole we could disappear into this morning. But for our purpose, I think the very real important point is just that we discuss there is a presence in this world that we can only call satanic. There is a force of malevolence that holds a great deal of sway on this world. A malevolence that cannot hurt God. And so it turns its attention to what it can do. It can hurt that which God loves. And as Lewis said, this is not an omnipotent force. It's not a counterpoint to God. But at the same time, it's not nothing either. And so there's two equal errors, I think, that when we focus on the satanic, the first off is we disbelieve in its existence. Right? This is not a metaphor. This is not a figure of speech. Jesus believed in this being. Jesus confronted this being, rejected it, rebuffed it, taught us to do so in the same way. But the other error is to believe in it a little too strongly or to focus on it too much, right? To focus too much attention toward this thing. Not every terrible thing in the world is a direct attack by the devil. But I would say that every terrible thing is a result of its influence. Jesus doesn't spend a lot of time talking about this being, but we can glean some things from Jesus' interaction with it. All right, first off, Jesus was not surprised by its presence in the world. So don't be surprised when evil attacks you or those you love. If you belong to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then God is your king, and the Satan cannot stand that. And so while the devil does not cause you to be separated from the love of God, it, doesn't, it does want to make you weak and impotent to the things of God. Apostle Peter warns us in 1 Peter 5, 8, Stay alert. Watch out. For your great enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Don't be surprised. Secondly, Jesus was prepared to face down these attacks, right? And this is one of the reasons why things like prayer and Bible study and Christian community and service are so important for us. Because the Satan is working through today, through things like lies and deception and fear and immaturity and false teaching and anything else, to rip us away from the effectiveness of the Lord and joy in Christ. And so listen to Peter. Be on guard. Stay awake. Stay humble before God and others. And remember that God is greater than any evil in the world. The one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. Now, let's jump back into that story of the blind guy. From John chapter 9. Because again, now remember, Jesus' disciples asked Jesus, why is this guy blind? Right? What, was it his fault? Was it somebody else's fault? And in John 9, Jesus says it wasn't because of his sin or his parents' sin, Jesus answered. This happened that the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one sent us. For the night is coming. And then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. I want to break Jesus' response down here in two parts. First off, Jesus basically says, you're asking the wrong question. It's nobody's fault. Right? A lot of times we read this passage, and the way that we hear it in English, we often come up with a third option. Was it his fault? Was it somebody else's fault? Or was it God's fault? Right? Sometimes we read this to say, well, God made him blind so that everybody could be impressed when Jesus healed him. I don't think that's the point Jesus is making here. Right? I think Jesus is saying, this is just life. Sometimes terrible things just happen. And the world isn't the way that it ought to be. And there is disruption of shalom everywhere. And so the question isn't why. The question is, what are you going to do about it? 
Jesus is saying these situations in life are opportunities for the power of God to be born in our lives and in the world. So God longs to do something in all of our circumstances, no matter what that circumstance might be. This brings us to the second part of Jesus' response. He says, suffering is a real thing. It's a reality in our world. From ground to glory, it will always be a part of the human experience. So what would Jesus have our response to be? He says, we must do what has been assigned to us to do by the one who sent us. And while we're here, while it's light, while it's day, let's be about those things. Let's be about our master's business. Right? Is there anything we can do about suffering? How can we be agents of relief and compassion and healing in this world? How can I rise above my own pain or the evil that's been done to me the suffering that's causing me to lose heart and hope. First off, I would say we should always be prepared to seek God when that happens, in the storm. Understand that God does not cause our suffering, but God can work in the midst of our suffering. Romans 8, 28, Paul writes, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and called according to his purpose. I got to be honest, I would rather this said that God works in all the good things or all the happy things or all the nice things. But Paul writes, in all things, God is at work. You look at the story of Joseph in Hebrew Scriptures, how his brothers sold him into slavery and basically gave him up to die. And he spends years forgotten in prison and he's falsely accused of horrible acts and hit after hit after a hit in Joseph's story. But Joseph understands the character of his God. Maybe better than a lot of us do. And he knew that God could take whatever humans meant for evil and find some way to bring good out of it. Genesis 50, Joseph says, you, he's talking to his own family here, by the way, you intended to harm me. But God intended, or God devised, or God found a way for good to come out of that, to accomplish what's now being done, the saving of many lives. There's this wonderful quote, many of you have heard it, uh, Fred Rogers, uh, the famous Mr. Rogers of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, that great PBS show that ran from the 60s up until, I think, 2001. Fred Rogers often told a story about when he was a boy and he would see scary things on the TV, and his mother would encourage him, and she'd say, when you see terrible things, terrible stories in the news, always look for the helpless. You will always see people that are helping. And he was comforted by that realization that there are still helpers. There's still so many caring people in the world. As Christians, man, we need to be prepared to be those people. Not people that offer thoughts and prayers from a safe distance but people who put aside our agendas and our opinions and our explanations and find ways to be the hands of Jesus to people that are hurting. Because with the suffering and the grief and the pain that you might be facing, as hard as it may seem, trust that even in that, God is at work. So ask yourself, like, where might God be in this? Where might I find God in this terrible place? How might love and justice and compassion and mercy be expressed even in this terrible thing? Like, this isn't good. But is there any way that God could find a way to make something good? Second, don't be afraid to feel whatever it is that you feel. Don't ever let anyone tell you that it's wrong to feel anything. If you're sad, feel sad. When Jesus' friend Lazarus died, Jesus wept. All right? And it wasn't like a single tear down the cheek. John uses this word that means blubbering cry. <laughs> like Jesus knew how that story was going to end. He knew what he was going to do later on that day. 
But he arrives and his friend is dead and his friends are weeping and he bursts into tears. So embracing pain and acknowledging loss is not negating faith. It's part of being in the likeness of Jesus. If you're angry, don't pretend you're not angry. God can take our anger and our pain and our doubt and our questions. God is big enough for my rage. God's big enough for my fear. We have, an under, we have a God who understands our pain and our suffering, a God who joined us in our suffering. Jesus took on human flesh and was born in our world and experienced all the things we experience. He experienced hunger and sickness and the elements and betrayal and loss and unease and death. And Jesus gets angry a number of times in the Gospels. But it's never in response to genuine people who are wrestling or struggling or even doubting. He gets angry at injustice. He stands with those on the receiving end of unfairness and cruelty. His anger never led him to sin, but he felt it powerfully. And he never denied it. But that's not the only thing Jesus was angry at, okay? There's an account in Mark's gospel of Jesus meeting a man with a skin disease. And he asks Jesus to heal him. And there's a bit of disagreement of the Greek wording here. Most translations say Jesus was filled with compassion for this man. But the earliest texts we have say that Jesus got angry when he met this guy. So we have to ask, well, who's Jesus angry at? Well, he's not angry at the guy with the skin disease. I'm certain he's not angry at God. Do you know who it is that made him angry? He's angry at the snake. He's angry at the Satan. He's angry at the skin disease that has plagued this guy for so long. Jesus is angry at the reality of suffering because it's not supposed to be here. Matthew 29, Jesus describes his healing ministry as him breaking into the house of a highway bandit and stealing back all the stuff that guy had stolen. Jesus says, I'm here to get back what belongs to God. He sees disease and suffering as a thief. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus sees a woman with a back problem. She's been crippled for 18 years by some dark spirit. And Jesus says, this ends today. He sees suffering in the world, and he is angry at the adversary that has brought it about. And all the ro roads of cause and effect of human evil and suffering in the biblical story that all lead back to the moments back when humans first believed a lie, and we've been believing that lie ever since. And that is who Jesus is angry at. It's who we should be angry at, is the Satan. So God, in his mysterious purpose and mercy, he's raised up this righteous servant who will go into suffering and defeat it on its home turf and then emerge victorious on the other side. And this is the story of Jesus. We don't always get an answer to the things we wish we had answers for. But the story does reveal a God who is not aloof or separated from pain or suffering. The Bible speaks of a God who is willing participant in the experience of human suffering. We just celebrated the incarnation this last month. The coming of the Christ, the God who took on human flesh and lived among us in the suffering of human experience. Hebrews 4, 15 says, The high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same testing as we do. He didn't sin. He didn't fall. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, because there we will receive mercy and we'll find grace to help us when we need it the most. Psalm 34, David writes, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Has your, has your spirit ever felt crushed? Where is God when cancer is diagnosed or when a divorce occurs or when your family is crushing you? God is beside you. God is there with you. And there may not be an easy answer coming. There may not be a clear-cut 2 plus 2 is 4 explanation. But we can always trust that the presence of Christ will never leave us. 
So when someone you know is stumbling or wrestling or fighting through it or being tossed around by it, just resist the urge to offer platitudes. You know, resist the urge to try and make it better with a bumper sticker slogan. Listen attentively and think carefully and speak honestly. And follow the advice of Paul in Romans 12 where he says, Be happy with people that are happy and weep with those who weep. Jesus saves is true, but our response to those in the midst of suffering needs to be so much more than just a billboard for them. I'm convinced that there's great openness to the Christian faith in the context of an honest and substantive conversation. So the question that inevitably, inevitably comes up when we talk about suffering is, well, couldn't God just snap his fingers and stop all the suffering? I have to believe the answer is yes, God could. But to do so would be to fundamentally change reality. Right, to strip humanity of its agency and turn us into these wind-up toys that just did what we're programmed to do and just turn the whole world into an ant farm. This is the conundrum of God, that this being of infinite love will not strip us of our ability to receive and experience and express love. But because of that, it can't fully protect us from ourselves. And I have to believe this causes God a great deal of sorrow. Jesus looked out over his beloved Jerusalem, and he's reflecting how mixed up and twisted they were when it came to the ways they treated each other. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones the messengers. How often I have wanted to gather your children together like a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you wouldn't let me. But wait, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. Doesn't God sometimes step in and do stuff? Doesn't sometimes God change things? Yeah, we have instances in the Bible where God does supernaturally intervene in the natural world on some occasions. His friend Lazarus that died, he raised him back from the dead. The guy in John 9, he cured his blindness. He gave him his sight back. And we don't know why or how God chooses where to intervene and where to restrain. Again, when my mother was dying of cancer and I was caring for her in her home, I wore out the floorboards in prayer, begging God for a miracle. I do not believe that God wanted my mom to die. But God could have cured her. And God did not. And that was not an easy pill for me to swallow. In Daniel chapter 3, when Daniel and his three friends are thrown into this massive furnace for refusing to bow down to a Babylonian king, Daniel says, the God we serve is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, he is still God. And we will still only serve him. That is a tremendous statement of faith, and I'm not sure I ever really understood it until I went through what I went through with my mom. And most days I still don't. Faith is not an abstract idea. It's the light in the storm, but it's not easy, especially when we experience suffering. So finally, last third response. Our response to suffering is just to hold fast to the truth that Jesus Christ has overcome. And gives us victory through him. And there will come a day when all things will be made new. There is a promise of God to which we have to cling. The Apostle John shares a glimpse of this new reality with us in Revelation 21. He writes, he has this vision. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Everything old had passed away. I saw a holy city. A new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now here among his people. I'll live with them. They'll be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death and no more sorrow and no more crying and no more pain. All these things will be gone. The simple truth is that there 
is devastating pain in this world. There's no way to get around it. No way to explain it away. And Jesus never claimed that we would be exempt from it. But as children of God, living under the reign of the Prince of Peace, and in this new kingdom that has come and is still coming, we have been promised that we will never face any of it alone. We have an opportunity and a responsibility to make that presence known to a hurting world. So let the words of Jesus ring in our ears and give strength to our hearts and move us to action when those around us suffer. Jesus said, we must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. For the night is coming, and then no one can work. But while Jesus is here in this world, and Jesus is here, amen? He is the light of the world. So may we be bearers of that light. Would you pray with me? Father God, gracious spirit, beloved Jesus, we come to you as broken and hurting people. We are blessed in so many ways, but every one of us has been touched by sin and illness, by carelessness and disregard, by neglect and negligence and outright abuse. Our world is not the way that it should be, and we confess that we have contributed to the brokenness in our world by the things we have done and the things we have not done. But we believe that you are still at work in our world in ways that are both dramatic and subtle, and we want to be a part of that work, that relief to people that are hurting. And so show us ways that we can be your light in the dark places, that we can bring your relief to people that are hurting. May our deeds be greater than our words. Let us be driven by the notion that the world will not know what we care until they, I'm sorry, will not care what we know until they know that we care. And when we experience grief and loss and pain, Father, just overwhelm us with an unmistakable sense of your presence. May we feel the safety to rage and rant and rail and gather us under your wing. We love you, Father. And we know that you love us. And all God's people said. Church, Stone, as we start to sing this next song, will you please just have a seat and let the words wash over you. Just feel God's presence as he dwells here with us. Just take heart to what we're singing. Maybe that's how God is working in your heart. Maybe that's how God is calling you to reach out to somebody else who's hurting right now. Take this fainted heart Take these tainted hands Wash me in your love Come alive grace again even when my strength is lost, I'll praise you. Even when I have no song, I'll praise you. Even when it's hard to find the words louder than I'll sing your praise. I will only sing your praise. 
take this mountain of weight take these ocean of tears and hold me through the Even when the fight seems lost, I'll praise you. And even when it hurts like hell, I'll praise you. Even when it makes no sense to sing louder than I'll sing your praise. I will my soul waits only for you. I will sing till the morning has come. Oh, Lord, my heart burns only for you. You are all, you are all that I Now, church, may you know in the depths of your heart that God is not the author, author of your suffering, that God desires to join you in your suffering and desires your freedom. When we hear the world cry out why and how, may those of us that are followers of Jesus resist the urge to fault-finding and blaming and platitudes to find real ways to love people that are hurting. May we be the helpers that the world so desperately needs now. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn toward you and bring you peace. Amen. Y'all have a great week.